Let's see, yesterday, I sent out a message about this, but I just, I want to get it on video. I, we would, remember we talked about the equivalent, an equivalent circuit when you're near the resonance, vibrational resonance. Um, I mistakenly thought we were dealing with the thickness vibrator, but it wasn't. It was the length expander bar. So those L's are right. Remember the LT thing that I just never ended? That was all a waste of time. Okay, it was. Uh, it's, so it's all right. There's, it was the linked expander bar. Uh, okay, so we did the first problem of this problem set yesterday, which is good. And so now we're going to do the remaining problems. Now the first one is number two. This is a plug, uh, it's often it's called a plug-in problem, but it's, it's important in this course to come up with definite numbers for things and be able to look th values, parameters up in tables, right? So here it is. So this is a length expander bar. It's problem one. But now we're going to um, consider a specific material. It's going to be barium titanate. This is otherwise known as Navy Type 4, and you can find tables in Chapter 4 on this. And uh, let, me, let me look at the problem again, just to be sure here. OK, so we're given the dimensions, as you can see. And we're going to calculate various quantities, the blocked capacitance, the uh, fundamental free bar resonance, square the coupling coefficient, resonance, anti-resonance, and the ratio in, ratio of turns. So you can find these in chapter four. All right. Uh, the fundamental resonance is just a half a wavelength. So it's easy to show that this has got to be the frequency. And this is in the lecture notes and the book. And also, I don't want to go over this again, but um, it's in the lecture notes or the textbook. You can look at either place to find that um, once we know the resonant frequency, we can get the anti-resonant frequency, anti-resonance frequency from here. And we'll do that in this problem. OK, so first, the square of the coupling coefficient. This is transverse 3, 1 because we're driving one way, the main response is in the other longitudinal direction. So it's given by, a, a, by this expression. We plug in the numbers. This, this is, everything is in SI units here. So I'm not going to list the units, OK? Um, but if you're always worried about that, you can always check. You know, do a dimensional analysis check. This is dimensionless. And you know that. And you can also see it explicitly from here. Um, OK, so everything's in SI units. I plug the numbers in, punch it in the calculator, and I get this, uh, looks like kind of a small value. I don't know. It's 0 .0, around 0 0.04 for k squared. The blocked capacitance um, that you're, are, you're well familiar with this from the laboratory. Um, and in, in lecture, we've seen this a lot. This is the formula, same as up there. So plug the numbers in. And uh, we get, this is typical nanofarads, 1.27 nanofarads. I get that. And again, everything's in SI units here. So the result has to be in farads. And I get 1.27 times 10 to the minus 9, which is a nanofarad. Uh, finally, the, the dimensional ratio of turns is given by this expression. Not finally, but the, the dimensional uh, ratio of number of turns is this. So again, plugging things in, um, we get this. And it can be, uh, there's two, two units that people use here, newtons per volt. Oh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You can see in the units, you can see the coupling, the, the transduction, right? Mechanical, electrical. 
which has got to be, because that's what the transformer does. Um, and I've forgotten the other units that are sometimes convenient. Uh, there's another, I think this is usually more convenient, Newtons per volt, but there's a, a simple, simpler mechanical to electrical. There's, it's also simple. I can't remember what it is right now. Sometimes that's useful. I think usually this is more useful, the Newtons per volt. Um, so uh, resonance frequency. We need to know the speed. This is the speed of sound for waves here. These are compressional waves where the wavelength is assumed to be long compared to the transverse dimensions. So Young's modulus is operating. You've got bulging and contraction here because it's long wavelength compared to the cross dimension. So the Young's modulus is uh, 1 over the compliance, as we've seen many times. Plug it in, get an answer, and it's typically, you know, kilometers per second, right? So if you get a value, you know, here of hundreds, if you get a speed of sound for hundreds of meters per second in a solid, especially piezoceramics, you made a mistake. That happened to one group, right? So you want to notice these things. This is typical. This is typical for sound in almost all solids. It's thousands of meters per second. Uh, so from that we can get the resonance frequency. There it is. So now, if this doesn't look familiar to you, just derive it. Okay, it's a it's a half wavelength resonance. So you use omega is equal to c k or the more elementary one, that this, this is equivalent to omega is equal to ck. And the wavelengths here is twice the, the length of the system, the, the rod or bar. So Um, hold on. Yeah, okay. So um, we plug it in and we get this. It's about 27 kilohertz up there, typical kilohertz, tens of kilohertz. Uh, now the anti resonance frequency. Okay, remember resonance, this is um, resonance and anti resonance here are the classic KFCS definition. Vanishing of the input. Um, reactants, right? And you get two. Remember the, the diagram um, way back in chapter two? We get two solutions there. One is the resonance, one is anti resonance. So um, here we go. We plug in, we have this relationship in general. We can calculate this, we get minus 26. Now, there's no way you can analytically solve for f of a here. This is a transcendental equation, as we've discussed before, and as you saw in 3119. Um, but it's surprising how quickly you can get three-figure precision with a, cal a handheld calculator. And you've all done this, right? We get to do it again one more time. So um, here's what we're trying to solve. We need to find the arg This, this is common quantity. So let's call it something. Let's call it alpha. So I need to solve this equation for alpha. Now, um, this is a fairly large number compared to 1. All right? So that means that the tangent, the tangent blows up for what value? For what, what value? For 0, it's, the tangent is equal to 0, or alpha is equal to 0. So, no, <laughs> pi over 2. And you, I just see the, I see the trigonometry. I see an angle here, and the tangent is this divided by that. So when it's up here, what's the tangent? It's infinite. So it's 90 degrees. It's pi over 2. Now, if you go, it, it'll, it'll diverge. It'll be infinite. If you go just on the other side, because now your triangle's over here, this is negative, it's going to be negative. So it's clear that we're going to be a little bit beyond pi over 2 to get a solution here. So you can start. 
you know, mm -hmm. start at some, some, you can't start at pi over two because that's, you know, that's going to, um, that actually gives you, what does pi, what does pi over two give you for this? Infinite? No, what you said uh, before. A one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. good. <laughs> Uh, I think that's right, right? The tangent of alpha for small alpha is equal to alpha? Okay. So, all right, however, you know, that's a weird, um, you know, pi over 2 is weird. This function's discontinuous, you know, and it's, it's blowing up and it's discontinuous. So you want to go just on the other side. So you can start um, wherever you want to, something a little greater than pi over 2. And that's the 3119 thing, where you just uh, you make a little table. That's what I do, and you of your guess of your the left hand side. So you you have an alpha. Here's the simplest way to do it. This is the way I do it. This is, it's, you know, you make a table and you start off. You're going to start for a little bit greater than pi over two, and it, it could be just something simple. Calculate the value, and you just go down here, and it's amazing. You know, you don't have to go very far to get. Um, pretty soon, you're going to find your, you you can get three-digit accuracy. So what I found here's what the result of the, the table that I did. Um, I went a little farther than I, pro I, I needed to. But I found that it's between 1.594 and 1.595. So it's 1.59 to three figures. Right? OK. So we set that equal to that. Now we can solve for the anti-resonance frequency. And this is interesting. It's only 1% greater than the resonant frequency. This is all happening close, you know, relatively close relative to this value. You know, relative to a hertz, there's a big difference between the two, right? So it's, everything's relative. OK, any questions about that problem? Yeah? Would plotting that function help you at all, or is it just as easy to do the calculator method? Yeah, you can. Um, the, the standard way that it's, th this is, goes under the name of root, finding a root. Because you can express this, and this, so this is a very general problem that comes up in everywhere, engineering, physics, mathematics, all the time, right? So you can think of this as this is, this is your function, and you want to find a root. This is a function of alpha, and you want to find the root. So you can use root finders. And there's ton, the root finders go back at least to Isaac Newton. There's Newton's method. You've ever heard of that? Maybe? Uh, see, I haven't thought about that for a long time. I think it allows you to approximate the square. It, I think what he was, it's a general method, which I think he was interested in finding square roots. You know, he didn't have, he didn't even have a slide rule, right? So, uh, do you guys know what? I, never mind. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, I'm sorry. What was your question? I forgot. Would plotting it help at all? Yeah. You know, if you really want to, I don't think it's worth the time. But so, so, the way you would, you could plot this function and look and see where it crosses the x, the alpha axis. Okay. Right. But you know, the calculator method is just, I, I was impressed by that. It, it, you know, like I said, it's really, it doesn't take much time. It's actually kind of, I think it's kind of fun. It's, it's refreshing. It's different and simple. And you're actually making progress, usually. After you get, you know, then you start to diverge and you go back. <laughs> um, now, you know, of course, you want to, I guess an issue is, you know, you can start, it, it, you don't have to be real careful where you start, but you want to be, you don't want to take a real small increment, because then your table can get to be really long, okay? And everyone goes through that, I think, when they first do this. You probably went through this in 3119. So you want to 
go pretty big steps here. And then, you know, if you overshoot, then you go back and you make minor steps, kind of successive approximations. Okay, enough said on that. All right, so the next one here, does anybody have any questions? Any other questions for this one? Okay. Uh, the next one is problem four. Okay. So we're going to, again, it's the length expander bar. A lot of problems in length expander. In fact, it essentially, you know, on this problem set, all of the problems are essentially the length expander bar. Now, the next one's going to be a cylinder, but we're going to imagine spreading it out and opening it up. So all of these problems are linked to expander bar. <clears throat> and we're going to use it as a hydrophone. OK, so let me remind you. So we're going to take these to be exposed to the sound. It's going to, we're going to take, make the usual assumption of long wavelength sound. So that means that every instant of time, the um, there's the same instantaneous pressure because the wavelength is long, wavelength is large, right? That's a really, as I told you before, it's a really important approximation. We're going to continue to make that. <coughs> and so those those pressure swings are going to cause a, a voltage change, and you can use this. Um, so you can use this as a hydrophone. <coughs> Okay. Um, the, the you know the canonical variables here are the the forces and they're related to the pressure. It's just the pressure times the area, which is the width times the thickness. Um, now the wavelength is large in the water. It's going to be even larger in the solid. We talked about this yesterday, I think. I don't know. I think it was yesterday. So we're in the low frequency limit here. We don't have to worry about standing waves. So what do you do? We've got this exact solution, OK, embodied in this equivalent electric circuit. And here are the parameters for Z1, Z2, and Z0 somewhere here. I don't know. No. Yeah, in, in here. You want to make the low frequency approximation as early as possible, as I mentioned to you yesterday. It makes things much simpler. So let's do that. And it also has some kind of some physical, the physical significance becomes more clear. So here's Z1. Okay, remember that's there's two Z1s. And KL is much less than one now. We're in the low frequency limit. So as we just discussed, the tangent of KL over two is just going to be KL over two. And now I've plugged in. I got rid of the k, usually we go to a frequency rather than wave number. It's almost always the case, right? So I've done that going from here to here. I plugged in z0, which is in the diagram. I, didn't, I guess I didn't write it down yet. But you can find it in the equivalent circuit diagram. And now I get a kind of a mess here. But if you stare at this for a while, you'll see that it's actually quite simple. Look at that. So it's an inductor. It's, the, it's, an, like a, it's an inductor equivalent to the mass, but it's half the mass. It's not, it's not I omega m, it's half the mass. And that's not a mistake. And the reason, I think, is that, remember, the bar is going like this. Not all of the mass is participating in the motion here, right? There's a node right here. So I think roughly half, I think half the mass is, part, on the average, is participating in the motion. And that's why that factor of two is there. Z2 on the other end, this is going to be a stiff, this is inertia, this is going to be, it's got to be stiffness, okay? And not at all obvious here, but when you crank through, small KL, here we go, uh, and get rid of the K, similar before, uh, plug in what Z0 is, <coughs> stare at it for a while, and eventually you're going to realize that it's, it's the impedance of the capacitor, the, the emotional capacitor, okay, this, the, the, the uh, compliance. Compliance is analogous to capacitance. Um, here's the mass, let me remind you, this is the, 
compliance, and um, which I, we can identify from here. <clears throat> and again, let me remind you, remember this S here is it's the material compliance. <clears throat> to take into account the geometry, the compliance is proportional to the length. If you double the length of a rod, it's easier to stretch and compress. It's twice as easy. So that's why it's proportional to L. If you double the cross-sectional area, it's half as compliant. It's twice as stiff, and that's why that's there. We've seen this before, I'm just reminding you. So this is very physical right here. Okay. All right. So and now we're, we just hit part A. Uh, okay, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's been a reason why I did that. I, I, I don't care. But <laughs> now we're at part A, and it looks kind of funny. Um, open uh, hydrophone, right? The most important quantity, open circuit sensitivity. So we're going to calculate that. Now, I've, this doesn't look like the equivalent circuit, but I've just kind of rearranged things, sort of rectilinearized it, kind of, make it easier to see. Uh, you don't need to do this, but um, for some reason I did it. Maybe back when I was preparing this the first time, I had trouble seeing it. I don't know, but I did it like this. Or maybe I just wanted to just clearly e exhibit the sequence here of reducing it. So we have, um, here's the general situation, okay? on the mechanical side. Now, because it's a hydrophone, I'm going to remind myself here that there's no current that greatly simplifies things. As you see, as we've already, we've already seen this a number of times, we're just going to keep seeing it more and more. This is general. Now, we have the same force here. Think of it as a voltage, same voltage. So if you think of this as ground, these two points are at the same voltage. We can just imagine tying them together. Um, and these currents, we think of these as currents, they're the same. The total current is the sum of the two. And again, the mechanical analog of that is that what's important is, is the relative motion. So I'm going to switch to the, to the sum here, but not the sum here. It's the same, same voltage here, same force here. And two impedances in parallel, the same impedance gets halved, the simple reduction there. And now I see two impedances in series, so the total impedance will be the sum. So I'm just going right along here, the simple steps. Oops, I did two things, okay? I combined these, which is trivial. And then what did I do? I removed the transformer, right? The transformer, again, is very useful because a lot of, ultimately we want to deal with mechanical quantities here. Um, either in the beginning or in the end or somewhere, and it's the transformer that allows you to do that. But when we solve for a system, we want to go completely electrical. So we remove the transformer in the usual way. Remember, the impedances get divided by n squared. Um, remember the rule? Current gets multiplied by n. The voltage gets divided. The force, whatever, gets divided by n. And that turns all of these mechanical quantities into electrical quantities. So at this point, we have a fully electrical circuit. And we can. It, uh, now it's just a simple matter to use Kirchhoff's rules. So we're going to use the loop rule here. Uh, for the left loop, I see this, I, this is a voltage, and it must equal the sum of the voltage drops here. The voltage drop is the impedance times the current. Okay, and then all of this current goes this way. There's no current there. So all of this current goes here. So the voltage drop across here is going to be the same current, NU, times the impedance, which is 1 over omega C naught. So I get this relationship for the right loop. For the left loop, it's very simple. Don't make it hard. You know, it's simple. Remember, this is no current. The, the current through here has got to be that. So. This voltage increase here has to be equal to the voltage drop, which is just the impedance of the capacitor times the current. So now we can um, eliminate, we're not, what we want to find is um, the sensitivity. So we can eliminate the current here. We can eliminate NU specifically, put V in here. And then we can form the ratio of the voltage, 
to the pressure, which is what we're interested in. So many volts per pascal. That's the open circuit sensitivity. So here's what you get. If you take those expressions, you get this. Now I want to, of course, simplify this. So the first thing I did here is I plugged in what Z1 and Z2 are in our approximation, right? Long wavelength, low frequency approximation. That's what I did going from here to here. Um, next, I multiplied, yeah, I multiplied, sorry. I multiplied through by I omega C naught. That's a natural thing to do here. We're going to get, that makes this dimension just one, which is dimensionless, and this. And we're, you can see the ratio of C's here. And this is off, as I mentioned to you in the past, this is what people often go to. And you'll, you'll see it here as we move along. So I see the ratio of C's here. And I'm, and I'm not happy with, you know, this is still too complicated. So I look, but we're, it's nice we're, we're in dimensionless quantities here. That's nice. Things are usually more transparent when you express them in dimension dimensionlessly. And what's this? This is the emotional capacitance in, you know, farads, right? So as I told you before, to deal with, to deal with um, transitions like this, people usually go to the electrical equivalent of the compliance, which is the emotional capacitance, which is n squared times c. So we know that this is dimensionless. They both, they both are electrical quantities. What do I do with this? Well, you'll recognize here, this is, um, you know, this is the compliance, which is one over the stiffness. This looks like a, a characteristic frequency here, omega naught squared. Now, it's not the resonant frequency, but it's going to be roughly around the resonant frequency. It's just a characteristic frequency. It's a quantity that has units, um, you know, the square root of, uh, one over the square root of m times cm has units of frequency. So it's a convenient parameter for our system. And when I do that, I substitute in, I get this nice looking expression there. We've seen similar things earlier when we were looking at accelerometers and things like that. You know, it's just nice, so at this point, that's it. We got some, you know, simple, relatively simple quantity in the numerator here. And um, we got a dimensionless number here. And we can see how when the frequency starts to get near or is much or greater than this characteristic frequency, how this is going to affect things. <coughs> now, however, the premise to get to this point, we had to assume low frequency. Remember? So you can only trust this expression in low frequency. So you want to be really careful if you try to extend this out. Because um, <clears throat> omega naught is going to be comparable to the resonant frequency. And this expression is only valid for low omega. So we really have to kill this, OK? So you want to be really careful if you if you try to get some information when you do something like this, because you don't want to forget the assumptions that have gone into this. We've assumed low frequency. So we kill this, and guess what? We get a flat. This is not flat in general. But in our approximation, we have to kill this, and we find it's a constant. So it's flat. It's independent of frequency, which is almost always desirable, as we've discussed, for a hydrophone. Um, okay, so um, that's the expression, um, nice simple form. Now, you always want to be concerned about, and I was concerned in the lab last, well, I don't know if you guys noticed, I was looking at this cable and thinking and talking to Jay about it. You, you, here's our transducer, our hydrophone, okay, we have this, it's, you see a bl block, uh, what you see here first is this blocked capacitance. Cables, you know, coaxial cables, or any cables, are going to have capacitance, right? And often, you know, this is typically nanofarads. So often you have to include the cable capacitance in there. If you use this formula, you could be way off. I mean, you could be significantly off. And by that, I mean, you know, a factor of two or maybe even worse. 
So it's important to recognize that you need to take into account cable capacity. And some manufacturers, they give you a cable like that. Remember the accelerometer you saw? Came with a cable, that micro dot cable, that little red thin cable. And it, its capacitance was, uh, it was calibrated. The capacitance was on there. So it's simple to take it into account. You, it's all in this diagram right here. You just replace C0 with the equivalent capacitance, which is just the sum of the two. So it's very easy to take into account in the sensitivity here. But you got to do that, OK? When you buy a transducer like this, even though it may come with a cable, you know, when, when you open up the little pamphlet in there, they, I think they're going to give you the sensitivity based on just the transducer. You have to be, you have to be careful about that, OK? Uh, I, I'm not, it may vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, but you always want to be sensitive to that. That we're not talking about large capacity, so you have to deal with, you have to think about cable capacitance. That's a practical thing. Okay, any questions about that problem? Okay, here's the final length expander bar problem. It doesn't look like a length expander bar, but you know what's coming here, right? <laughs> so here's the problem. Um, it's, we're told that it's Navy Type 1. Oh, we're going to do numbers here. Yeah, right. Okay, that's good. It's Navy Type 1. There's radial polarization. So, um, <clears throat> so, and, and you can, um, we're going to think of this as a pr projector or a vibrator. Uh, and this is a common thing that people do. They'll cap the ends, not just for projectors, but also hydrophones. And we've got a big, long chapter on hydrophones coming up eventually that, uh, where we're going to look into all this, these different geometries. Uh, people have done a lot of work on that, as you'll see. So we're going to cap this. Now, Brian has one end cap and the other end un uncapped, OK? And I, I cannot solve the problem with it like that. We have to symmetrize this problem. I don't see how you can take it, where, it's what we're going to do with this problem without symmetrizing. That's why I told you in the assignment sheet. And I, I got his handwritten solutions from the publisher, uh, Carl. I think his name was Carl. <laughs> What's this person? I was just looking at it because uh, Professor Smith needs to get books for the distance learning students. And uh, is his name? What's his first name? Wiseman. Is his is his first name in there? God, I, yeah. the that's the the publisher. It's probably not going to be in there. Anyway, he's. I don't know if I told you guys this. He was a student here in like the 1960s. The publisher. I probably didn't tell you this. No. OK, yeah, you can call him up and talk to him. He loves to talk, if, if he's still alive. OK, now I, so I talked to him. Uh, this, is, this is the way you think when you get to become my age. You know, you always have to think, oh, I wonder if he's still alive. Um, so when I was preparing this course, it turned out to be 2008, OK, well before the course began. And I was looking around for textbooks, so I talked to him. And I wanted Brian's solutions, right? Obviously, wouldn't you want those if you were going to teach a course that you knew nothing about? OK. <laughs> and um, so I talked to him a lot. He, you know, he talks a lot. But he's a real nice guy. And he said he would give discounts to NPS students. So I, that's why I have his telephone number in Python. I don't know if you guys noticed that. <clears throat> Did, maybe you didn't even look. Uh, look. Yeah, yeah, you it that. should be in yeah. there. Yeah, I guess I should have put in there why I put his telephone. Yeah, so the yeah, he, it's a very small publishing house. I think the publishing house is like his garage. That's the feeling I get. And he lives uh, very close to where I grew up. I grew up in Mountain View, famous now for what? Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. So, yeah, he, I think he's in Los Altos Hills, which is close to. There. Okay. Uh, anyway, I don't know why I started talking about this. Why did I start? Because you got his solutions. Yeah. OK. So I, what? Did he count both ends on his solution? No, he just kind of 
came up with this answer, <laughs> that, and and uh, it just wasn't. You could, I couldn't justify. It just can't be justified. It gets really nasty when it's not symmetrical. Okay, and I'll make a brief comment at the end about that, and you'll see. Okay, so anyway, here's what we're going to do here. Because this is thin. Okay, and also if we imagine that the wavelength's large, we can just, um, the main motion here is motion like this, and we can imagine just open this thing up into the length expander bar, as we've discussed before. So that's the way we want to think about it here. The, the width of the length expander bar is going to be the mean circumference, standard, you know, to take the mean value here. Um, so we can use our theory. All right. Uh, so what do we got here? Um, so the resonance here is going to be half wavelength resonance. We're going to now, in general, when you when you load something, you can change the resonant frequency. Okay. In general. Now, the next thing is typically what, what transducer people do, at least in courses like this, is they assume a purely resistive load. Is that going to change the frequency? Not, not unless it's serious, very, very big. Okay, remember? Just, that's just the harmonic, damp-driven harmonic oscillator. The, the, the resistance has a very small effect on the resonant frequency. It has to be a very low Q before you start to see that, okay? All right, so let's find the, um, the resonant frequency here. Um, here we are. This is Young's modulus, assuming it's, it's bulging and compressing perpendicular to the, you know, to the length, right? Now, this turns out to only be an approximation. We'll discuss that in a minute. But let's calculate it. We get kilometers per second, 3290 kilometers per second. Okay, and like I said, I'll explain to you why it's approximately a minute. It's best to wait. The fundamental resonance for the unloaded case is a half wavelength. So here, oh, here I've written it out. Okay, so it's the speed divided by the wavelength. The wavelength is twice the length. I think we've gone from capital L to script L, no big deal, right? Uh, so everything in SI units gives us 16.5 kilohertz. All right, that's the resonant frequency. Part B, is um, let's find the, again, there's this word approximate, we'll explain it, for the ring mode. You know that this thing is going to have a ring mode, OK? Right? Now that's, it's not acting like the length expander bar. It's now acting, you know, you gotta, now you have to imagine the way that it actually is to see the ring mode there. We can use our theory. Now, you have to be a little careful, as I'll explain. But we, we have the ring theory. What we did for the ring was we assumed that the transverse dimensions are small in both directions compared to the diameter of the ring, OK, or the circumference or whatever. Now, we don't have, I just want to point out that we don't have that here. OK, a ring, this would be small. This is comparable to the cir circumference. OK, so well, we can handle that. And I'll show you how we can handle that in a moment. But let me, I better follow this. OK, so if you need, now, now you want to, you need to, this is not obvious. This is not, this is not obvious. You need to look back at our, theory, our ring theory. So we can take our ring theory for the resonant frequency and calculate it. And you can see that it's about 30 kilohertz. OK. Now, why is this approximate? Well, the ring is going like this, and it's bulging and contracting. But we have this pretty long cylinder here, right? So we're going to get bulging and contraction this way. But what do we get this way? It's going to be stiffer. We're not going to get that complete Young's um, Poisson's ratio effect. You can actually go back to chapter two at the end. Remember we talked about all those different speeds of sound? Mm -hmm. What we want to deal with here is not a ring, but a plate. You want to think of this 
as if, if this were infinitely long, it would be unidirect, there would be no strain in this direction. So we actually have an expression for that. You can find it. The, the system becomes stiffer. So instead of Young's modulus, what you want to use is Young's modulus divided by 1 minus nu squared, where nu is Poisson's ratio. And you can see Poisson's ratio, remember, is typically between uh, 0 and a half, something like that. This is going to be, it gets stiffer. Typically for solids, the, the uh, Poisson's ratio is about a quarter. So it's not a huge effect here. But it is stiffer. And we can calculate an improved value for the speed here for the wave speed. See, we assumed it was this before, but using the plate idea in one direction, we get this. And when you find, when you calculate this, you get this, which is only a 3%, it's not much, just a 3% correction. Now, what does this have to do with up here? The longitudinal wave speed. Well, it's the same thing. This is very similar, right? We have this cylinder. We've got a longitudinal standing wave here. If, if Young's modulus were accurate here, we would have um, So it's just going like this. Um, I'm drawing a blank here. Right. So we imagine, imagine folding this out like we did before. OK? And Young's model says, OK, you know, fine. The wavelength's large compared to this dimension, so we're going to get the bulging and contraction, the Poisson's ratio effect. But what about this way? Well, it's more like a plate. It's more like a plate. So we could correct for that, but the correction is small. OK, it's going to be on the, the, the percent level like we just saw here. So we'll just stick with this value for simplicity. It's going to get changed a little bit. We could improve that, but it's not going to be a big deal. So we'll just stick with that value. OK, so here's the equivalent circuit. And now we've got a load on here. OK, there's this, this is the radiation resistance. Um, and you can see it's we got plates on both caps on both sides to make it symmetrical. Uh, and we'll talk about the value of this radiation resistance in a minute. But we need to, uh, oh, and here, let's look at these other values here. Here's the block, the stand, you recognize the standard formula for the blocked capacitance here. And we plug in the numbers, nanofarad, typical nanofarads, tens of nanofarads, very typical. Uh, the ratio of turns on the order of unity here in SI units. Z1 is given by this, Z2 is given by that. And I didn't plug in values because we're going we're operating, we're going to operate this on resonance. And these things actually blow up. They cancel. On resonance, they cancel. They're both infinity. One's plus infinity, one's minus infinity. So, so they cancel. So I didn't put values down there. Um, Z0, I think I went ahead, I don't know if we really need it, but I calculated Z0. Here, okay, now, I don't think we need it. Now the radiation resistance, what's that? Well, that's an impedance. And assuming a purely resistive load, so the waves, you know, for plane waves of sufficiently short wavelengths, ooh, what is that? Does that cause a, do you see a problem here? Um, aren't we operating? Was that this question or the last one? <laughs> it's easy to get confused, isn't it? Now, we're operating on resonance here. We have a half a wavelength. The wavelength in the water is going to be less, OK? So it's not, this is not such a bad thing. But we're making an approximation. I want to make sure you understand this. A purely resistive load means there's no reactance. It means the wavelength is short, small compared to the size of the cap. Remember, we talked about this a lot last quarter. So when you have that, you have essentially plane waves coming off. It's a purely resistive load. 
right? So that's an approximation here. And it's usually a real bad approximation for transducers, in, at least in textbooks. And the problem is to go deeper, to get more accurate, it would be, it would take a, it would be trouble, okay? So we just usually make that approximation, understand that we're just getting a rough value in the end. Um, so how good it is here, I don't know if it's easy, it'd be easy to check, but I, I, have, I would suspect that the wavelength is not much smaller than the 1,500 meters per second compared to twice. Yeah, I'll bet, I'll bet the wavelengths. You can calculate. It's really easy to do. I'll bet the wavelength is not small compared to the radius or diameter of the end cap. But we're going to make that approximation. So when we do that, we take the uh, specific acoustic impedance here. This is purely resistive. And because we're dealing with forces here, we need to multiply by this. This is the pressure divided by the velocity. We need to multiply by the area to get the force divided by the velocity. So that's the radiation resistance. Kilograms per second, there it is. Okay. Now, our diagram here, obviously, due to symmetry, it's going to simplify. Um, you know, you can see that we're going to get half the resistance, and it's obvious, right? It's parallel here. If we didn't have this, if we had, if we remove um, if we didn't have the symmetry here, it gets a lot harder, as I mentioned before. And I just don't see how to... Um, how to deal with that. But if anybody gets interested, and you, and you have any ideas, or you, or you just want to discuss it, come, come by my office. I haven't thought about this for a while, but I just remember struggling with this and not being able to get to get anywhere, not, not be able to reduce it unless it was symmetric. So uh, you can always um, contact me, okay? Um, so on resonance, th these are, uh, there's no resistance in here. On resonance, this is purely reactive, and resonance is going to be the, those vanishing. Right, these vanishing. It turns out they're both infinite, but you know, it's infinity minus infinity. But they vanish on resonance, and so the circuit becomes very simple now. We have our equivalent resistance here. There's a factor of two because of the parallel resistances, and now we can remove. Finally, we can remove the transformer, and we get this nice. And this is what's in Brian's solutions. I remember. Okay, <laughs> and I and. Uh, so, you know, I went, so the first thing I said, okay, well, I'm going to do it right. And then I said, no, I'm not. It's too hard. I think, just remember it being too hard for whatever reasons, reason or reasons. So, I don't know how he, he made quite a leap to get to here. I don't, I don't think it holds. It holds in the symmetric case only. Uh, okay, does anybody have any questions? So, I need to send out a quiz, right? So, um, yeah, that'll be done sometime today. And it'll be due, you know, next Thursday. Okay. All right.